Well, thank you for staying with us on the AM show. This morning, uh, we're going to give you a better understanding of this package called the E-Levy. We're going to break it down for you and have you know the nitty gritty. What is going to nation building? Where do we go? Well, we'll be finding out as well why some experts or analysts are pushing back or kicking against the E-Levy. Joining us for the conversation, Dr. Patrick Assuming, senior lecturer with the University of Ghana Business School. We also have uh, Seyram uh, Kawa. Uh, senior lecturer as well at uh, school for joining the conversation both of you good morning and thanks for having me okay so morning, uh, just to confirm uh, uh, which which one just spoke is that uh dr Kao? it's patrick, patrick so we can hear you as well good morning all right Everyone. it's yeah. it's it's a pleasure uh uh Having, having you join the conversation. Right, so we'll be getting into the nitty-gritty. We'll be getting into the, the, the main facts of the matter, why we've called, uh, and so we can analyze. I just want to go through a bit of an analysis of, of what the core issues are. So uh, Dr. Esuming and uh, Sayram, do hold for me. We'll be right back to you. But uh, in the studio, Isaac Kofia J is back on the board. And dynamics, right? Just give us a breakdown of what we're looking at that we, you're going to be doing. All right, ben, before we start, let's note that these are our own calculations, you know, and it's subject to any change made by government. Right. And so let's start with um, e levy. Let's assume explanatory as possible. When you say the value added on the transaction, what are you referring to? It means that, you know, 100 cities is not taxable as far as the e levy is concerned. Right. So it means that from 200 cities onwards, is taxable. Mm. So it means that from 100 cities to 200 cities, if you move from 100 cities to 200 cities, you've added an additional 100 cities to it. So we are going to tax that 100 cities you've added. Mm. Oh, you, you get what I'm trying to say. Mm. So let's assume you are you know, transferring an amount of 100 cities. This is the, the telco's charge. Mm. E levy is not applicable here. So the total charge will be one city. And as you bring your total to 101, you know, CDs. That's the total cost to the sender. Okay. And now, if, but, but, just, just to clarify, of course, so if you're sending above 100 CDs, so if you're sending 101 CDs, mm -hmm. those ones, the, 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 the one the CD... The one CD is the value added. Right. So we are going to... Where a one CD component will be the service charge. Exactly. If you were sending 101 CDs, then that would kick on the one CD yeah. that is added. The value added. So we are looking at that assumption for now. Mm. And then if you are transacting, let's say, 500 CDs, the value added here is 400, value added here is 400 CDs. The telco's charge will be uh, 5 CDs. E-Levy is applicable here, which will amount to 7 CDs. And the total charge will be 12 CDs. That is on the 400. On the 400 CDs, value added. Right. And this will give you a total uh, cost of 203 CDs, 75 I think cases. you've moved from 500 to 200. Sorry, 500, so 500, 500. CDs is not going to be affected. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have the service charge, which is 5 CDs. Yeah. And then you have the e levy, e -Levy. coming through at 7 CDs, yeah. which will then add up to give you 12 CDs, which would mean you're paying 512. Yeah. So here the assumption here is that e levy. So let's assume you are transferring an amount of thousand CDs. Mm. Remember that from thousand CDs, the the it's rate a fixed, is fixed rate or flat rate. So it means that you'll be paying an amount of ten CDs as the service charge. Mm -hmm. E levy is applicable here, which will be fifteen to five pesos, and the total cost to the sender will be thousand CDs to um, and thousand CDs and what twenty five. 25. So 1,025 CDs, 75, 75 pesos. That would be the total cost to the sender. So the 15 CDs and 75 pesos will be on... The same rate, flat rate, that's right. 10 CDs. E-Levy is applicable here, 33 CDs, 25 pesos. Mm -hmm. And the total charge will be 43 CDs, 25 pesos. And this you know, figure is the total... You know, uh, Doing the E-Levy at 1.75% mm -hmm. constant with, with the 1% the service charge, charge also held at a constant. That yeah. will give you 2.75 exactly. on anything above 100. If I'm transferring exactly. 2,000 CDs, I'll be paying almost 44 CDs. 1% service charge. We are not looking at the other 1% if you want the person not yeah. to pay anything. And we'll get to that. We'll get right? to that side. Okay. Now, let's look at E-Levy. This means that here... The telco has reduced their service charge by 25%. Mm. 
And that is something that has come up. Yeah. So this right. is a different dynamic. Let's look at this dynamic as well. So 75 pesos. The total cost will be um, 100 CDs, 75 pesos. Now let's right. move to um, 500 CDs. Again, the value added here is you know, 400 CDs, 7 CDs. And if you add it to the telco's charge, 3 CDs, 75 pesos, that will give you a total charge you know, of 10 CDs, 75 pesos. Right. Now the cost to the sender is 1,000 CDs, a fixed rate of um, 100 CDs for service charge. And e-levy is applicable here, 33 CDs, 25 pesos. And the total is 43 CDs, 25 pesos. And this will, will amount to 2,000 and 43 CDs, 25 pesos to the sender. Mm. Yeah. So let's, let's do some more because there are many different permutations we can do with this. Now we're going to look at what? An e-levy at 1.5%, mm -hmm. yeah. which is a, a dip in the e-levy. Yeah, so assuming e-levy is at 1.5% 1. 1. and then you know, the service charge is still at 1%, let's look at the dynamics. We are still taxing the value added. Mm. You know, the value two cities. E levy is applicable here. That will be one CD, 50 pesos. Total charge will be five CDs. And the total cost to the sender, that will be two, uh, 201 CDs, you know, 50 pesos. The value added on the 500 CDs is 400 CDs. Now, the service charge, which is the 1%, will amount to 50, uh, five CDs. And E levy is applicable here, six CDs. Mm. And the total charge is 12 CDs, 50 pesos, to the uh, 2,000 CDs. That we are, and you can see actually, yeah. you can see the total cost of the sender reducing because again, mm -hmm. the the e levy is now being pegged at, at one point five percent. Uh, so one point five percent, and we can also look at the e levy, uh, the, the the service charge I should say at zero point seven five percent, which would also give us a much lower pay. Five percent and mm. service charge has been reduced by twenty five percent. So let me start from 500 CDs. So 500 CDs, the value added, the total charge to the sender is 9 CDs, 75 pesos. Right. And the total cost to the sender is 509 CDs, 75, 75 pesos. pesos. Right. And from 1,000 CDs onwards, you know, the rate is flat. So, but still at 1,000 CDs, an e-levy will be 13 CDs, 50 pesos, total charge 21 CDs, and the total cost to the sender, Ben, would be 1,021 CDs. And, and you can see a steady dip. Yeah. Uh, the question is, for those watching, whether on every transaction of about 2,000, you would be willing to pay about 40 CDs on it to help the national kitty. But the, the, there is this dynamic as well that we can uh, look at. So what it would mean, if, if we are doing the in- mm -hmm. I pay five CDs on, on, on that. Yeah. And that, that is the normal service charge as we know it now. So five CDs on that. If I want the other person not to have to Pay lose to any money, to, same to cash out 500 CDs, not 495, yeah. I have to add another five CDs. Yeah. Or so obviously, it's going to go up. So it's going to be double the service charge plus either 1.75 or 1.5. So I term this as the cushion amount. Mm. Mm. The amount that you're supposed to cushion the, the person you're sending the money to so that he or she can withdraw the same amount. So again, one percent that would be five CDs. Mm. E levy seven CDs, and total charge will be twelve CDs. Now, because I want the person withdrawing to withdraw the same amount, I would have to add five CDs. That the total cost to the sender will be um, five hundred and seventeen, you know, CDs. Ben, let, let, let's let's quickly do this. Let's look at let's compare this five hundred or these five hundred and seventeen CDs to when it is just. 1%, one way, 1% okay. without the additional 1%. Okay, let's, let's move to the next slide. This, this is when you want the person withdrawing to cash out the same amount, but mm. e-levy is at, you know, 1. So again, um, 500 CDs, value added is 400. Mm. The service charge here is at 0.75%, meaning you're going to pay an amount of 3 CDs, 75 pesos, and the cushion amount would have to be, you know, 3 CDs, 75 pesos, and the total charge to the, the sender will be exactly in, in this instance. Exactly. Right. So can we do that quick comparison? Uh, so w when we have the two-way thing, 500 CDs, of course, it, the component that is going to be affected is 400 CDs. But we are using the 1% service charge. Five CDs here, five CDs there. You would be looking at 570 without the, the, the second components, the cushion amount. 
without the cushion amount, so 517 CDs without the cushion amount, what would we be looking? At? So we'd be looking at 512 CDs. Yeah. So it's an increment of another five CDs, exactly. which stands to reason because you are adding five CDs for the other uh, end. Two dynamics here is either you know government agrees to tax the value added or tax the volume of the transaction. And we have the an that analysis here. Maybe because of time, we might not be able to do Already, the government is operating a budget um, with almost 37 billion CDs. And if government is not able to pass this e-levy, it means that the deficit is projected to hit almost 43 billion. We're going to hide in our own corner and have a discussion on. For now, we're going to allow the experts as well to share their thoughts. Kofi, great job as usual. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Ben. Let's, let's have our guests uh, now, Dr. Patrick Assuming, Senior City of uh, Cape Coast. Dr. Assuming, let me start with you. And, and this is actually called from uh, basically uh, Dr. Abdullah Ali Nachia, a phone that I'd like to run by you. Uh, taxation is the price we pay for living in a civilized society. You want to live in a society where your roads and other things are provided. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes. But there's also this bit about Frederick the Great saying, no government can exist without taxation. The money must necessarily be levied on the people. And the grand art consists of levying topical matter of an e-levy. Do we need it? Do we not need it? Um, good morning again. I think on <laughs> whether we need it or not, I mean, the government obviously needs a lot more revenue, given, well, you know, our finances is uh, facing some challenges. I think for a long time, we have not been able to expand our revenue base. So if you compare us to our peers, we don't collect as much tax revenue as we should be, given our level of output. In, in, in the and last then, year, part of it projected. So we are not faring badly at all. Well, GRE, what GRE uh, collects is just one part of the total tax revenue government get. If you look at the total that we tax effort, it's quite low. Um, at the end of the year, I think we did about 12.4%. We should be hovering around uh, 18% and above. And then also, we see that several decades to borrow a lot. And because of that, we, we, you know, our debt service has gone up. If you look at the budget that was presented, I think the single biggest is a lot more revenue so that uh, we can also sort our finances and also bring the much needed uh, improvement in the lives of Ghanaians at the moment. The e-levy, you know, in principle, it's a it contravenes or it's, it's not consistent for has been seeking to make the economy cash light. And also over the past few years, we've been trying to bring more people into the financial. In the period that we are in, COVID is still around. I don't think that is something that we want to be encouraging at this moment. The other thing we have to look at is that even in the finance minister's own budget for 2022, you saw that there were other revenue measures, property rates, trying to collect more property taxes, which right. is more progressive, by the way. And then also paying more attention to the exemptions bill. The exemptions bill, the exemptions that cost us when we were under the IMF program. So for me, I don't think at this moment, even though we need more revenue, I think we should be looking at other sources rather than electronic levy. And interestingly, even what you said, Dr. Assuming, in Uganda, a 1% uh, rate was levied on fees for all money transfers, uh, except those conducted by the banks. But in that same year, by July that same year, zero point, it was brought down to zero point, uh, you know, using the mobile money transactions, about a quarter of the people, which is huge, 25%. So what is going to be the impact? Uh, only time will tell. But let me, let me come to you, Cyron. What, what is your take on an e-levy? We need to develop as a country, but uh, as some people have said, the least. Uh, what is your take? Do, do, are you in support of an e-levy at this time? Can you hear me, Sairam? And, and maybe you, you may have you. to unmute. Thank you very much. We need money as a country to develop. We need money for infrastructure and all the things that we want to do over time. Taxation is one way government could raise any amount of money that is needed for whatever jobs we want to do as a country. 
but the tax must be in consonance with the objectives of the nation and where we want to take ourselves to for us carrying cash along on whatever we want to do. So coming up with taxation on e-levy, uh, on our electronic transactions, especially mobile money, and any other uh, electronic demand of sales service using your ATM, uh, you are using e-switch and the rest, where tax will be paid on this particular amount of money. This is a tax that can easily be avoided if it could be avoided by the people who are going to pay it on the more that we transact, I don't think it's a way to go. There could be a much broader discussion. For example, there are a lot of businesses that have come up with online transactions. The Registrar General's Department is the one that is mandated to register these businesses. And now we have our uh, communication departments, uh, e-business transactions that are in existence. So in my view, government could target these businesses and then raise the necessary amount of revenue we want to get from them. If the telcos have reduced their rates by 25%, in my view, it's more than 1.75 or 1.5%. It means that earlier on, the third schools are making a lot of money from the Ghanaian citizens. That same thing happened in our oil sector. The oil prices go up and then government comes in and then the prices go down. So that discussion needs to be made. Sending money to buy some items for example earlier on i have to add some more amount of money to this particular one and if we can avoid that particular one it means that we will go back to where we are starting from not including a lot of people in the formal financial sector of the economy and so in my view government must explore other party tax and the rest and i've also added that government must go for the businesses that have established that particular um, way of making money and tax them appropriately. Uh, Sayram, are you suggesting that, but are you suggesting that we cannot do at all with an e-levy? You were talking, and rightly so, about the fact that if the telcos are reducing their 1% by 25%, bringing it to 0.75%, that is something that we could latch on to. What would be your suggestion? Can government back off from the e-levy and say, once the telcos have you know, reduced theirs, we're going to still peg it at 1% workable? That, 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 is, uh, that is something government should explore. Mm. Because as the tel telcos are charging us the, the um, 1%, we've been paying it. So if they are giving the 1% out, then government should focus on that particular 21% to raise some amount of money. There is need for more education on this, on the need for taxation. And if we accept that these taxes that we are going to pay will be used for the purpose for which they are collected, nobody is going to talk about it. But if we see that government officials are spending so much of our tax revenue and they are not accounting for it, and when we ask for that, you have stated earlier on, for example, we have road tools that are supposed to be used for our roads. Now, now we scrapped yes. that, so we are losing about 200,000 a day. A day. We are, we, are, we are pushing that amount of money away. And if, for me, in terms of finance, that is not a prudent decision to take. Mm. One is better than zero. So if you throw that particular amount away because people ask, what are you using that, that comes with it? And for that matter, you have to abandon that particular project. And you are chasing some amount of money, assuming that everybody is going to accept the payment of that amount of money. Then we are making a sad mistake. Mm. Policy objectives in this direction are good. They are okay. But let us adopt a different approach by way of discussions. Then we can all come up 
and said that let us go ahead and do it. Okay. But if government sits down and assume that, okay, this number of people are using Momo, mm -hmm. and for that matter, let us tax it, I can decide I am not going to use Momo. Right. It's not going to affect me. Right. So people Somebody are going to be carrying be cash used. to now start avoiding the same electronic processes that we've built an interest in so that we are more cash light. But let me come to uh, Dr. Suming on this matter. You know, I've read, I've, I've actually taken time to read extensively on, on levying of this nature across the country, and not, not across the country, not just across the continent, but or whichever other country, the ways they seem to be implementing them are in sharp contrast to what we are doing or trying to do in Ghana. Let's take even the African continent, for example. You look at Kenya, at 10%, and this is not 10%, supplies on fees for mobile money transfers and other financial transactions. But this 10%, of course, is on the service charge. In Tanzania, an excise tax of 10% is levied on mobile money transaction fees. In Zimbabwe, there is a 0.5%. When you look at all of them, it suggests that the fees or the service charges are what governments there charge on. But here, we are looking at a separate service charge and then a separate e-levy, which is why some of you in academia have called it regressive or a double. I, I think, you know, I will, I will side with you on so, on, on so many angles. It appears that if at the moment there's a what, 1% charge, which is also capped, if the government decided to, you know, impose a service, a fee on the or a levy on the fees, that will obviously represent a way smaller amount than it is seeking to raise. Now, I, I think what, you know, why we want to tax the transaction. Then, obviously, like you said, you know, one of the things that the finance minister said in the budget was that it is a way of bringing the informal sector into the tax bracket. And I completely disagree with that. Because the informal sector, they pay indirect taxes. So when we think about bringing the informal sector in, it's really getting them to pay more direct taxes, i.e. income taxes or businesses that are operating under the radar, bringing them into the mainstream so that they also pay. Uh, first of all, I think is you end up taxing already the, the, most, the most tax, that is the informal sector, because you, know, you receive your salary, you paid income tax. Then when you move your money to a different place or you are making a transaction, you pay a tax or a VAT on the item you are buying. And then you are asked to pay a tax for the mode of payment. So I think this is what people should understand. You are taxing one mode of payment. Obviously, when you make a transaction with cash, you are not going to be taxed for using cash for the transaction. So if one or the alternative mode of transfer along some margins is going to discourage the, the, the that mode of payment. And we should expect that you know we won't raise as much revenue as the government is projecting. I definitely am convinced that it is not at least in the first year, it is not going to raise six point nine billion dollars as it's projected. Mm. You you suspect it will not even be able to raise that. Uh, how come though? I suggest think that, like we've seen in other instances, like in the Ugandan experience, where you know about a quarter of people just went off uh, mobile money transactions. Are you suggesting that if if we go this way, people will be compelled to move their transactions away and go cash instead of cashless, and that is what will even lead to a reduction in the expectation? Is that what you're saying? Exactly that. So if mm. you look at the analysis that you were showing, I mean. At the top end, you write that to transact to send 1,000, you had to put an extra 53 CDs on it. You have to go to an ATM. For many people, going to the ATM will probably not cost them as much. So they will find it more helpful to, rather than sending mobile money, especially if it's in, the ATM is in close proximity. Many people, their threshold will be such that, you know, to send 1,000, the extra 53 is too much. So if they, are, if they feel that that 53 is too much, a lot more people will stop. And uh, I think I've been reading this morning on the, on the joint news for the first time that the, the Deputy Finance Minister has admitted as, as much, that within the first six months or so, they're expecting a 24% reduction in mobile payment. And that's exactly what, will happen, what I expect to happen. And when that happens, the government will not raise as much revenue as it, as it is projecting to raise.
In fact, interestingly, per some of the other studies, it could even uh, impact corporate tax they pay. So we could be losing from, from both ends. But let me come to Sayram on, on this beat. I know both of you are saying, I, I get what you're saying. You don't want the e-levy at all. But what if we had an e-levy and it was a reduced form? After all, we had that. It was kicked against 18 months later. We had it and now we are looking at what? Around 17, 17.5%. What if we had an e-levy, and, and this is my basis, maybe between 0.5% and 1%. You would notice that in the countries that have an e-levy pegged at 1% or a little above, it is charged on the service fees, like the separate charge or levy, apart from the service fee, they are looking at around 0.2% to 0.5%. So what would you say if this administration were willing to bring the e-levy down to a cap of 0.5 percent totally say that we are against the e-levy uh, as a transaction in totality if government brings it down i would go in for 0.5 percent 0.5 people into the tax net aside uh, bringing other people into the uh, the tax net there is the need for us to also explore other ways of raising the tax revenue, most of the people who are into this, most of the people are into family businesses. In Ghana, we don't have any regulation. We don't have any documentation on family businesses, business regulations and the way they could be managed and then sustain that particular area by getting more tax from these particular sectors. There are businesses area. The 25% reduction by the telcos can also go to government. In that way, we can raise the necessary amount of money and the Ghanaian populace would accept that this is the way to go. And if we see that these monies are bit to it, we can go up a bit in the future. But for now, going straight forward to 1.5% and the rest will bring us back to where we were before the introduction of the mobile money system altogether. Dr. Suming, uh, it is said, and, and your tax experts will tell you that uh, taxation is a process, not an event. It's not something that, bam, you do today and it's time. They were hoping to implement the e-levy by tomorrow, the 1st of February, 2022. That is not going to happen, at least not as we have it now with the pushback in, in Parliament. So what, what would you say this administration, if you were consulting or advising this administration, looking at the fact that that, for example, took about 18 months to come to a healthy release and this government doesn't have time, what would you proffer? Uh, yes, it's right that this government doesn't have time, but you know, I think the government has been doing for me the most important thing for expanding our tax bracket over the past five years people helping to identify properties and helping to identify individuals so and you see that they are taking those measures forward they are you know trying to get us you know to connect or properly identify us when you make mobile money transactions and from july we are told that we have to use the ghana card which by the way is a tax identification number now for all banking transactions in other words found either to pay income taxes or property uh, uh, profit taxes on the profit they are making. You know, we have, I think that's exactly what we've been doing for the past five years. So it's quite surprising that after doing all the hard work, it is not just time to bring them together, link the systems, so that whatever you are doing, you'll be able to find it. So for instance, if you have been doing bricks business and you've never paid any tax, and you go to DVLA to register a car worth uh, 500,000 Ghana cities, then the DBLA will relate that information to the GRE. And then GRE will ask you, I've seen that you have bought a card worth this amount, but by my records, you haven't paid any tax. So the GRE will now call you to account. When people know when we close all those loopholes, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, you'll be able to find you and tax you. The other thing is that it's, I think that the government has done a, a little bit of disservice with a little bit of flip-flopping in how it has handled some taxes over the past five years. So, you know, the, 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 
take the the rollback of the benchmark values. I mean, you know, when when it was being introduced, we were told how much extra revenue we will get. It appears that that didn't go too well. It is time to roll it back. But again, the government is still It appears that it's become too, or is driven a, a little bit by populism. The luxury, luxury vehicle tax. I think that was that was actually a brilliant tax uh, policy to have. But for whatever reason, you know, we, we are told that uh, you know we're raising as much revenue, and then we've taken it back. Then, like my colleague said, even though we said that the road tools were giving us inconveniences, the, the whole idea of taking back the road tools when we need every little penny of revenue we can get, I think it was quite surprising. So I think the government should just stay the course, you know, come up with a consistent strategy for uh, broadening the tax base and just stick to it. A lot of people will be convinced that this time we are, you are ready to go to the long haul. I think there's too much short-termism happening mm. with our attempt to raise the, 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 revenue does that, every... The, the, does that give you the impression, Doc, that there's a bit of confusion in terms of our economic management, in terms of managing the finances of the country? Because like you've likely said, I mean, who has an outlet for revenue and lets it go without necessarily having other measures that will generate more revenue? We've spoken extensively o over time about the road tolls that have been taken off. Yes, people, maybe it's easier going through the traffic now, but it means government is going to lose those 200,000 CDs every day. Not to talk about the jobs, especially for people living with disabilities. That is lost. Uh, you talk about other bits that you've, you've made mention of and how we're bleeding in those angles, the benchmark values and all of that. That, does it give you the impression there is some instability or confusion in terms of our economic policy management? I that think the economic, the management of the economy has largely been okay. I think maybe, you know, what, what happens is that what we need to do to broaden the tax, the, the, the tax is, is usually is medium term. And you have to give the government credit for trying to do that from day one with the digitization. But sometimes in the short term, it feels that you need to raise revenue from here and there. And it doesn't really stay the course. And I think that gives a little bit of uncertainty. So if you're thinking about what, what you've mentioned with, uh, with the benchmark values, I think the government is a little bit, feels a little bit more pressure to pass the E-Levy because at the moment we hear that it has put the benchmark values uh, roll back on the on on uh, on the back burner for a while. If you look at the projected revenues, I think the trade taxes, international trade taxes, were projected to go up almost 50 percent, largely on the back of the benchmark value review. So if that is not coming, there's a little bit more pressure. And we have to say that there's been the government had three years before the COVID, and some of the policies that were put in place then, some of them didn't help at all. In 20, 2018 or so, we decided to slash uh, electricity tariffs by, what, 30% or so, only to, during the COVID, come back and bring the uh, COVID, uh, uh, COVID stabilization levy mm. because of energy sector debt. So I think that, you know, there's some of the things that the government has been doing if you're scratching your head. I'll, I'll bring up at the tail end the, 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 the alternatives we can adopt. But, Sayram, I'd like to find out from you, from where you sit, is it, is it reflective of your thinking when the finance minister says, if we don't get the E-levy, and now he's conceded to 1.5%, our economy is going to face severe shocks and is going to be inimical to the fortunes of our economy in the year 2022? Basically, things will break down. Is, is that the real picture? Um, thank you very much. Um, if uh, the statement that if we don't pass the E-Levy, then everything is coming to an end will not hold. And I hold that particular view that without E-Levy, it means that there is nothing that we can do in our country, Ghana. No, it, it, can, it cannot be possible. Because when you look at the kind of corruption that goes, which are going up from time to time, 
So if we are able to reduce this amount of money, then it means that it is not a case like if we do not pass the e-levy bill and we collect that money, it means that our economy is not going to go up. We have money over time. There are more to be done in that particular area. So coming up to say that, okay, without passing the e-levy, then it means that the economy is coming to an end and we are going to go back and all those things. I do not agree with the finance minister humbly on that particular view. The a long-term strategy for the management of the economy. And if that, uh, we do it very well, then our economy will not be talking about um, e-levy today. We have all in our country, all revenue. What are, do we use it for? The diamond, the gold, the cocoa, hope, and everything is on the e-levy. Is that what we are telling Ghanaians? Some interesting in questions. No, mm. no it, it is not a case that without passing the e-levy, it means that our country is going to come to an end. It's going to be very difficult. Difficult in the sense that government has planned everything based on this particular amount of revenue that they hope to get from this particular right. The town hall meetings that we see government holding must be heard before this particular policy is being propounded. Mm. If the town hall meetings were to be heard all over the country and people's conscience have been built up into it and all those ones before the policy is being announced, this kind of uh, you know pushback, but 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 I, I'll come to you briefly, uh, Sayram, for maybe thirty seconds of wrap-up comments. So think of what you're going to uh, say in a nutshell. But Dr. Suming, so we know, for example, our one twenty-six state-owned enterprises bring us some what one valued actually at about one hundred and ten billion. That's about twenty-seven percent of our GDP. But guess what? Just last year, the prices are bringing us net losses. Over the years, this has been the situation. But if you add the wastage that the Auditor General points at, 12 billion Ghana cities, that can do a lot. That is way more. It's almost twice the E-Levy. If you add the 5.3 billion of our losses here, I mean, what are your projections, your final comments? What do you think we can do as an alternative to an E-Levy? Yes, I think... Uh... The, the waste is, is a problem, and it's one of the challenges the finance minister faces when he's trying to convince Ghanaians that, look, pay the E-Levy and I'll use it for your benefit. I think, you know, consistently U.S. funds are not being properly spent, and uh, we don't see the needed accountability. So uh, you wonder whether, you know, suddenly because of the E-Levy, we are going to be a little bit more accountable. But in terms of broader alternatives, I think, if you look at, if we go back to the budget again, we have to understand that the e levy wasn't the only additional revenue measure that the government, the, the government said is going to bring. I think that we should focus on the other things that were mentioned in the budget. The other things like the property taxes. We were told that uh, from the beginning of January, you're going to have much more from uh, properties because properties are fixed. They are in fixed locations. And uh, once you've spent a lot of taxpayers' money documenting uh, where properties are identified, where they are, it should, it should be easier to collect more. Then right. I will hammer again the exemptions. You know, in time past, the president has spoken about how exemptions cost the Ghanaian economy is almost twice what we collect with a uh, levy every year. Mm. So we should focus on that. And finally, let's keep pushing the digitization agenda in terms of raising the revenue. When the finance, when the vice president spoke at Ashesi towards the end of last year, he clearly explained how all this digitization that we've been doing for four, five years ago, because those are, are more long term and sustainable, and we okay. don't get the pushback that we are getting with uh, the e levy. It goes back to what we said: taxation is a process, not an event. Your final words, uh, say Ram, in in some thirty seconds. The way forward. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Government as a way of raising revenue should bring back the road toll. The road toll is something that um, can raise some amount of money. Even thinking about increasing the different types of private cars that you are using, you could pay an increased bit of that particular amount of money. Government should look at the expenditure side and see how they can reduce the expenditure side of um, the, the budget that we have. Uh, the 
situation where we have a lot of exemptions that are granted to companies as my policy on how we can manage our family businesses from time to time and then we raise the ne needed amount of money from there so that we can all go um, ahead together as a country. Gentlemen, it's a wrap. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us on uh, this matter at the school. And we also have Sayram uh, Kawa, who joined the conversation, Senior Lecturer, School of Business, UCC. Up next, though, Political Science Lecturer at the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo, is demanding a total overhaul of the majority leadership in Parliament. He's described the posturing of the majority side as hawkish. Assessment of the leadership frustrates efforts at building genuine consensus. He's been speaking in our latest hotline documentary, Ghana's Hung Parliament, a blessing or a curse. Here are excerpts uh, for you from that. Since the inception of the Fourth Republic, first time in Ghana's history, that the legislature recorded 170 male MPs from both sides and also 20 female MPs from the divide plus an independent MP representing the people of Formina in the Ashanti region. Some Ghanaians were excited about the current responsibilities and shopping the country's parliamentary democracy. Ransford Jampo is a political science lecturer at the University of Ghana. If you have parliament and it's always uh, one-sided, uh, one side led by majority and you always have minority and the majority you always have the, the powers of the executive. When we got to 2020 and we held elections, Ghanaians said enough of um, that kind of parliament. They voted to give us a hung parliament. And um, for me, it is unique to the extent that it's not happened before. It is unique to the extent that now flex governments and it's not particularly peculiar to Ghana. Governments, ruling governments have agenda that they pursue. They need to drive the agenda with the approval of the legislature as provided in constitutions the world over. And so if you have the numbers and you are in government, it makes your work easy. If you don't have the numbers that and travels with you on the journey that you want to go. So the first head of members of the governing NPP, had cross at the start of the 8th parliament, was to get the NDC caucus to back down on its quest to nominate a candidate for the speakership. Greed to nominate Aban Babin as their candidate for the election of the speaker, when former speaker of parliament, Professor Michael Quay, who at the time was still interested in being the speaker, reached out. But I told him. Bro, you know the difficulty that we have when we go through that path. But if your party can present you, and our party doesn't present a position, because as at that time, my party hadn't taken a decision as to whether we feature a speaker or not. If you can get your party to do this, and then my party doesn't put a candidate on my way to reach out, and I also added, sorry, that since after the election, nobody is reaching out from your end. So my party hasn't yet met. We are meeting today to consider what to do. And I said, oh, that moment is the council of elders on our side. In my view, if you could talk to uh, Hackman, who is the council of uh, chairman of the council of elders, to start talking from the top. If some understanding is rich, that then it becomes it. But obviously, as a way, I will stand by what my party. A minority determined to elect Arban Babin as Speaker of the 8th Parliament began mapping out strategies. The first was to court the support of the independent... What was his reaction? He wanted time to think. And I can tell you one funny thing. I spent more time talking to his wife than himself. As part of my strategy. Talking to his wife, telling her what we were ready to offer, if you could come on board and what of you. Until the powerful king called him. And then obviously they were all responsible. Then the powerful king called him. And then when he told me, I said, Well, this is a king that myself I, I, I revered. So it will not be good to disobey him. That's my advice to you. 
is that you know how they treated you. Don't accept anything. If you accept a military position, do you believe? Buys, uh, Chrissy Parker Wilson. Good morning, like sir. Good morning, good morning. I greet you, sir. I, I greet you. Prof, Prof, I greet you. Do, do you want me to get on your case? Oh, no, not here, not here. Let's, 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 let's talk about the hang Chrissy parliament. Parker let's talk about the hang <laughs> parliament. <laughs> but the hang parliament, it's turning out to be what many people didn't expect. From mm. the outset, you know, we felt, oh, it's going to balance things out. But the balancing has been something, which, which I believe in. Though I must state clearly that the majority leader says mm. there's no hang parliament. Mm. And of course, in this documentary, he provides reasons why he believes there's no hung parliament. Political scientists will tell you once it's 137, 137. Forget the extra person who, exactly. who is an independent candidate, though. <laughs> and, 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 and you see, when, it, when you watch this documentary, mm. it, it tells you the psyche of the majority as against the minority and mm. the independent aspect we spoke to. And let me say that uh, in, since the Fourth Republic, many have said that parliament has become a rubber stamp. And so the outcome of the 2020 election gave us a responsibility and I can give you an example. You call the approval of the PDS uh, right. in Parliament because right. the, the majority at the time had overwhelming majority. Mm -hmm. In spite of all the consensus, 150 something. 169. Right? 69. That's against one, 109. Right. So in spite of all the consensus raised by the minority, the majority still approved mm -hmm. the deal. Now, fast forward to the eighth way. Mm -hmm. Now, you remember the Japan deal? Yes. What happened? The ma minority kicked against it today is out of the budget. Right. You remember the Ketasi Defense Project. Right. Now the e levy mm. And that has become a major source of controversy. Mm. 137, 137. 137 says we want to we try to establish whether you're having the benefits, you are reaping the benefits of a hung parliament, right. or perhaps it's becoming a care to the ordinary Ghanaian. And I must uh, tell our viewers that this question is being answered in the documentary. Mm. Uh, I spoke to uh, Professor Wansford Jampo, right. a political science lecturer at the University of Ghana. I spoke to Dr. Rashid Draman, who mm. uh, works at the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Right. In fact, he's special of parliamentary work. And I mean, you should watch him give an account of how this parliament has become over the last one year. And even the conduct of the majority towards the speaker. Mm. In fact, we are learning that there was a meeting in, among the leadership of the House mm. that the majority leader should tone down tells me that he has never seen a speaker who has been challenged under this Fourth Republic more than the uh, right to honorable speaker, Alban Babbage. You know, the other day I was having a discourse here, I think it was with Manuel Carante, mm. my other colleague, and I was mentioning that, you know, even on the back, so is this, if you want to build consensus, or if you want the other side to hear you out, right. and, and then you start agitating, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but... You don't know how it's going to work out. But, then, but I, I must say that this evening at 8.30, right. uh, the documentary is airing, of course, um, at 8 for the 5 documentary. I entreat all our uh, viewers mm. uh, to spend some time and then uh, watch this documentary to understand the nature of the uh, parliament you have in the aid parliament. And every individual in this country is interested in parliament. You right. have a representative in parliament. So right. you need to watch out for... Uh, what they do in Parliament, as Chairman Sabosi said, go through the laid down procedures. Right. But we'll, we'll talk about everything. In fact, let me tell you the secret. The NDC has put together a 15 member committee. They mm. call them the bad boys. The bad boys. The bad boys. TBB. So we have MPs, your MP, who wow. perhaps is in Parliament. And he's and, a bad boy. And he's a bad boy. He's a bad boy. And so these bad boys are the ones who ensure that at every critical including the election of the speaker, the e-levy, among others. So as you are going forward, the next uh, probably two and a half years now, the bad boys will have a lot of work to do. When there is critical decision to be taken in parliament, these bad boys will be given the assigned roles to ensure that this commentary. At I told me so. I told us wrong. The bad boys. <laughs> the bad boys. They call them the bad boys. You want to find out about all of that, all the fireworks on this hotline documentary. So don't you miss out on... Uh, that. But thank you very much, Parker, for joining. Thank you for having me, Ben. Well, right from here, right from Parliament, we'll be looking at, well, maybe the broader uh, situation. Not just what Jay has been talking to us about how he feels the contagion that has affected Mali, Guinea, and even recently Burkina Faso is also extant right here in Ghana. We've heard the likes of Professor Enning. We'll bring you that conversation right after this.